open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going we're gonna to read the right verses the first time this week so that uh, you'll be with me in the same area. 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to be reading 1 through 9. I'd like to ask you to stand with me, if you will, as we pay respect to the Lord's word. Chapter 2, verse 1 reads, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord, and coming to Him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected this became the very cornerstone, and as a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellence, I'm sorry, the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You may be seated. I titled this Call for a Purpose. Uh, I really want to emphasize uh, just a couple of points tonight with this passage. It'll be our last evening, normal Sunday evening service before the new year. I wanted to leave you with uh, both a reminder and a, a great time of celebration over the next couple of Sunday evenings as you do stay home and, and plan out your evenings with your family. What a great joy it would be if you would remember the passage that we've just read here uh, for your purpose. I'm going to ask uh, a couple of you to uh, read for me verses in just a moment. But uh, two questions I, I really kind of wanted to touch on tonight is, what are we called to? What is it, when we talk about being called, what is it we're called to? And then the second question is, what has he promised us? What has he proclaimed about us? if you will. And so the first point I see in this passage is that we are called to join his family or the family of God. We are called to join the family. Verses 1 through 3, if you'll read them again with me, it says, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander, like newborn babies, uh, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. What a beautiful picture it is. But this is not the only place in Scripture that tells us uh, that we have been called to His family. If you will, uh, Eric, would you be willing to read for me Romans 8, verse 15? And Mike, would you read for me Romans 8, 16 through 17? Romans 8. Romans 8.15 Romans 8.15 For you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back in fear. But we have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, all of God. Alright, and Mike, Romans 8.16-17 the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and as children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs of Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. All right, it, it's, in, it's interesting that the Bible uses the term uh, adopted in this passage, the spirit of adoption as sons with Christ, because it was a different adoption system back then. <coughs> Uh, a person had to go through a very lengthy process. I understand that those processes are the same today. But, but at, during that time, if you adopted a child 
uh, you made uh, a promise not only to the child but to your entire community that you were going to not only take care of this child but you were going to treat them as your very own and in a, a society that we have today where many families do not do that I know there's some amazing adoption families out there but in a society in which that, that line would vary on how much it was done the Bible understood the laws of that time and so when God promises us that we have been Receive to him like adopted children. Understand that the promise to us is very clearly that we have been fully granted the rights of being in his family. Not, not just there where we see it, but where Mike read uh, that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Uh, if children heirs, so being adopted into the family does not mean just that we're part of the family, but it means all that the family owned has been given unto us as an equal partnership in that family. What a beautiful picture of God's promise to us when He tells us in Scripture that we are part of His family. That His all that He possesses, His blessing, His power, His strength, His grace, His mercy, I could go on for days. The Bible does. But all those things have been imparted unto you at the moment of adoption into His family. So when Jesus came in the form of the baby, and the proclamation was that this baby would be the Savior of the world, and then Jesus did die on that cross and absolve our sin through His death and resurrection, we who have believed turned our lives over to Him. We've been called to be a part of His beautiful family. And that, that it should just be such an encouraging promise from Scripture but there are things in here it says that, that, that align us with those family members. These things we put aside. If you look back at verse 1, we put aside all malice and deceit. We put aside hypocrisy and envy and slander. Basically what it's saying is we put aside the things that are of the world. The things that Satan has brought into the world through his deceit of us. The things that, that the trickeries and the hatred. That's why unity in the family of God is so important. That's why I think 2012 needs to be completely covered in prayer. Because our two vision words, our two purposes this year is family and what? Unity. unity. We have got to ensure that God covers our unity. As long as we're unified, God will be able to work through us in mighty ways. When we have disunification, only portions of us will work. And you're going to see not only we've been called in this family, but we've been called into the body. And there's a purpose for the body of Christ. And so as we go through, further into Scripture here, I want to point that out to you. So not only are we called to join His family in verses 1 through 3, but look at verses 4 through 8 again. It says, And coming to Him as, as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is a choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for the holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone with the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumbled because they are disobedient to the word and to the doom they were also appointed. Not only are we called to join the family, but we are called to be a part of the body. Many passages in scripture tell us uh, the role of the body of Christ. Let's, let's just look at a couple together. If you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to go to verse 27, 1227. First Corinthians 12, 27 says, Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. So understand that the body of Christ in, in, in His calling in, in this passage is represented here tonight, but each of us represent a portion of that body. And there's not one part that's lowlier than the other, although maybe in our our pride and our 
haughtiness, we may want to be a certain portion, Christ is the head of the body. He's the head of the church. And we've all been called to do our certain points. And I give you all kinds of illustrations, but you had those at Sunday school. So my point here is tonight not to explain to you all that situation, but to, for you to understand that when one portion of the body does not work properly, the entire body suffers. The entire body suffers. Look at Ephesians 4.16. Ephesians 4.16. We're going to see the very same kind of calling. Ephesians 4.16 says, From whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So the first rule of the body is to glorify the King. Glorify Jesus. Our role in the church is to glorify the Lord. But when we work properly, the, the first effect or the first result is that the body of Christ, First Baptist Church a whole, in this case, the body of Christ is edified, it's lifted up, it's strengthened, it's encouraged, and it feels the love. How many of you have ever had a situation in the church where you did not feel love? I'm not asking you to raise your hands on this, I just want you to think. Have not felt love by others. You know how much that hurts. I've been there too. And I want to ensure as pastor of this church, not that I lead you in loving one another rightfully, according to scriptures, but that we join together in doing so. It will not work if even one of us is disunified. And so I want you to understand the importance of it in scripture, not just in the passage we read in 1 Peter, but, but amongst us all these passages. It's not a coincidence that there are so many. This is a very important facet to how 2012 goes for the kingdom of God. Now you let me probably rejoice today in the fullness of this church sanctuary. There were a few seats available, even the balcony was very full. It was a glorious time. But what I rejoice most about is the choir was up there. Did you notice even when the CD player broke for a moment? Did you notice even they were patting each other on the back, smiling at one another, encouraging one another, and they never missed a beat. They never missed a beat. And Jake was able to get the thing working again with a kick and a punch, and, and <laughs> boom, they were off the same again, and it just flowed smoothly. There was unity up there today, and the result was pure joy, not only for the body, but for those visiting and what we want to do with our bodies, we want to add to it, right? I mean, our joy is to see God continue to add to our numbers daily, as He did in Acts. Look again at uh, Ephesians 5, verse 30. This will be our last verse to see about the body. But Ephesians 5, 30, just a page over, says, Because we are members of His body. Why is it important for us to be unified? It's important because we are members of His body. Not because we are trying to build up ours, I don't want First Baptist Church to be the best church experience in the community. That really is a far cry from my purpose as your pastor. I want First Baptist Church of Holt to be the, the best glorifying God body that exists. And the way we'll do that is to bring our praise and our glory together, lift one another up, and see God be uh, exalted, glorified. All the words that I, I mean, they're all running through my head. I'm trying to think of the best one. But, uh, that our, that our, our tip of our tongue would be his name first in everything that we do. There's a few things in this passage that I want to go back and point out. The first thing is there's, there's a warning here. If you'll read with me again, it says, uh, verse 6a, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Why? Because we won't perish. That's a promise. But also there's a warning in verse 7. This precious value then is for you who believe. Uh, but for those who disbelieve, here's the warning. The stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. Understand that disbelieving in God is not the thing that's going to make God unreal. 
He is still God. Jesus is still the Savior of the world. Those who reject Him, they're missing out on the blessing. They're going to, as we will who have followed and uh, dedicated our life to Him, we will not be disappointed. Those who think that they're wiser will be disappointed. Now, I just I understand that one of the, the greatest advocates for... Um, oh, I just drew a blank. What's the name of the uh, atheist? The, 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 the top person in the atheistic faith uh, just passed away. And I was disappointed to see that Christians were, were holding rallies to celebrate his passing. It was disheartening for me. We should be praying for them. Because when the Lord comes home and trumpets his people, they're going to be sadly mistaken. I don't rejoice in, in their passing. I'm saddened by the opportunities missed to share Jesus. It was God who once said that he would have chosen the Christian faith if it were not for Christians. We have to be very careful in the way in which we pridefully approach God's promises to us. The body of Christ should be very humble in the work that our Savior has done in our lives. There's a warning very clear in here. Being built up in spiritual houses by a holy priesthood. I thought these were uh, interesting phrases, passage two. Uh, one, I see there, there's a promise that we have an identity. We have an identity. Where you go to work, uh, when I was in the service, we just had a number. What's your number? Everything was number, you know, our social security number. And you had to give your last four or something like that, and they could identify you that way. Isn't it beautiful that in the kingdom of God, I'm not known as a number, but I'm known as a person. When Jesus was on that cross, he did not die for 9295. He died for Kurt Rainey. That's a beautiful thought. And in some of my most trying moments, God brings that back to me. He recalls that in my heart. But we also, because the Bible speaks of a holy priesthood, we can be promised that there's an access because we're with Him, we're part of the body. He's our Father, our Abba, our Father. We have access to Him. One of the things that in the Old Testament, if you remember, is that the people did not have direct access to God through prayer according to the priesthood that was existing at that time. They had holy of holies, they brought their sacrifice to the priest. The sacrifice was lifted up. The incense was supposed to be perfect. The sacrifice was supposed to be perfect. And in doing so, the priest would offer up prayers for their salvation. And it would cover them until the next time when they would offer another, uh, another sacrifice for more coverage. That's the way it worked. That's why it was so important when Jesus died on the cross that the Holy of Holies was rent apart, ripped apart. Because no longer was the access having to be done by a priest. We became, as Christians a royal priesthood of believers. We could access the holiest place and be in the presence of God and directly deliver our prayer to Him, the perfect sacrifice having been made once and for all. That's the beauty of this passage when it says that. So we had an identity and we have access. There was an interesting scene uh, that happened this week. I heard that I was on TV. That's not that interesting, to be quite honest with you. Your screen's probably cracked inside out. But what was interesting was how that happened. I got a call late that asked me to come up and help uh, to act in a drama at the high school. And so I did, and it was to be performed in front of the middle school and the high school. And the scene, basically, if you were here in our business meeting, you know this, you get this again. But if, you're, if you weren't here in this meeting, this first time you heard this, maybe, but the scene was depicting two cars uh, colliding, having an accident where there was a fatality. They brought a helicopter actually in from Sacred Heart, landed on the football field. They had kids all painted up like blood uh, on the field, in those cars, hanging out of the crashed cars that they had brought in and displayed them. And the reminder was two things. One, the kids would not text, would not text when they're driving. The odds of uh, teenagers and adolescents crashing and, and fatally killing one another was is so much more percentage when they're texting. I myself have a family member who was texting when they were a teenager and got an accident. They were spared their life, but it was a tragic situation. And in this scene, the driver was hardly injured, but the rider in the second car was killed. I, I had the interesting call 
to play the father of that child. And it was tough for me. Three teenagers of my own sitting in the stands watching this drama unfold. I wondered how I would do. I even shared that with you, Mike, because Mike was one of the uh, paramedic fire rescue guys that responded. It was amazing to me how many folks responded to just one two-car accident. I was blown away. And I was moved. It was hard to watch. The other uh, warning was to drinking and driving. Uh, these, you know, this happens so much in our societies, and we know that there have been stories of this over the years. Uh, look what the police officer said up there. He said, we do this so that maybe not one more student will die this way. Amen to that. But what was interesting to me what happened not only during, uh, my, my role was to, we were, me and my pretend wife were sitting on a couch like watching TV in the middle of the football field and the police officers come and they knock on my door and they tell me, you know, my wife, that what's happening, that, that there's been an accident, we think your daughter was involved in the accident, and uh, we're going to come and get you, and we want to take you over there so that you have a chance to, to look and see if it's your daughter. Well, well what's happened to her? Well, she's, this, this young girl's dead. And, I, you know, my, my reaction was to say, well, I just, I just talked to her a few hours ago. I mean, I was really trying to think what I would really say in a situation like that. So we went, we identified the body, it was our daughter in the, in the drama, and, and we were sad. And, and I cried out as I, I kind of just, I thought, well, if it was really me, I'd just lose my balance. I'd just fall. Because I'd just be so, I, I wouldn't know what to do if it was any of my children. But afterwards, it was interesting. Because so I cried out, I fell, and I cried out, oh, baby girl, because that's what I call my daughter, so it was a natural thing for me. What was interesting to me afterwards was what my daughter said later the next day. She comes home, we're sitting in the living room, and she says, Dad, all my friends were talking about how good an actor you were. And I know that ain't totally true, but it was nice of her to say. Uh, nice of them to say. Huh? <laughs> and, and, but what was interesting to me, she said, I had a hard time with it because I'm your baby girl. When I read this passage, I wanted to share that with you because there is something about being the child of the father that is so ultimately important. My daughter recognized it was a drama, but she saw me calling someone else for her name and, and it was weird. <coughs> Us as Christians, being the child of the king, we are called by our father with a very precious name. And it, it identifies us with Him. It not only it identifies us with Him, but it gives us access to Him. I said to her, I said, oh honey, that was, a, that was just acting. But you were really my baby girl. And when I thought of that girl on that ground, it was her face and my son's faces that I saw. And there was access. That little girl, I haven't talked to her since the drama. But that one, I watch movies with even today. How beautiful is the family of God. That we have access to Him. That it's not just something we talk about, but it's something we practice as Christians. Don't let that pass by. Don't spend a day where you don't spend time in conversation with your Father. All these things, that these warnings that creep into your life, malice and envy, anger, all these things will creep into your life. If you don't spend time with your father, and by the way, spending time with the family, being part of the body, practicing being part of the body, what would happen if I trained my left leg to run a marathon while I trained my right leg to be propped up at a desk? It would be an awkward run, wouldn't it? I'm not going to demonstrate it up here, although many of you are probably thinking I wish to would. <laughs> Romans 12:1. Just turn with me one more time there. I know I said we weren't going to go anywhere else, but what a beautiful picture this is. Romans 12, 1. When, when we know that we have been called, understand that part of that calling is to, to call us to something. We have a calling. And look at what Romans 12, 1 says. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies to the living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is, and this is always interesting to me, which is your spiritual service of worship. Your spiritual service of worship. It's 
So the last point I want to make tonight is not only have we have we been called to to be part of the family, and we've not not only we've been called to be part of the body, but we've also been called to receive the blessing. And that's the beauty of this message tonight: is that the Lord just doesn't call us to do something and tell us do this, do this, do this, this. There's a lot of things He does in that area, but but He always promises us something that's far beyond the call, that exceeds everything that we could have imagined. So I want you to look at verse nine. I want you to look at verse 9 and we're going to be done. In verse 9 it says, But you, that means you and you and you, you and you. That's all of us here tonight. It's not just us as a group, but each of us. You are a chosen race. God has chosen you to be His child in the same manner as He has called you to accept Him as Lord and Savior. I don't know fully how that works, to be quite honest with you. Greater minds than I have always tried to make it one or the other. And I'm just telling you, I think the Bible is very clear with both. But God has chosen us to be part of it. He's called for us. When we went to the cross, our name was on His lip. For you have been, I'm sorry, for, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. Do you know the royalty idea is an interesting one for us? It's so often we go to prayer with the Lord and we see ourselves as a beggar. We see ourselves as a dregs of society, the broken down, the, the, the hurting, the needy. And we are that when we approach the Lord in prayer. But we should come out of that prayer time, after we have approached the Lord because of the royal priesthood, we should come out of that with royalty on our mind. God has promised us that He is going to bless us. Jeremiah 29 says that He has a plan for us, a plan to prosper every one of you. His plan is not for your destruction, but for your uh, being ex exalted up into Him. That you're righteous because of His righteousness, holy because of His holiness. We're royalty in the kingdom of heaven. And don't go around with your head hung low when your Savior has lifted you so high by His greatness. What a beautiful picture that is. So you are a chosen race, you're a royal priesthood, you're a holy nation. Just a reminder of His perfect holiness. God is so holy that He can make not only a rain holy, which would be, by the way, a task in and of itself, but each one of you have been proclaimed holy by your Savior because of the holiness that He possesses. How much holy did one guy have? All of it. Beautiful picture to me. Uh, a people for God's own possession. We've been bought with a price. We're possessing by, of God's, and we're, it's joyful to be that way. I have, as Romans 12 once said, I have surrendered myself. It is my, as another translation says, my reasonable act of service. It's just what I want to do. And it's just what He's called me to do. And it's just what honors Him and brings joy to me to do. I love that, my, that I'm possessed by the Lord, I'm in possession of the Lord. Uh, he's in possession of me. Uh, and then the last one is, not only for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. And we sang about that today. We proclaimed His excellence in our songs. In the, in the pews and the chairs today here in the sanctuary, we proclaim His excellence. And I just want to challenge you that as we go through this week leading up to Christmas, as we advent towards Christ, or go further towards Christ, as that happens, I just want to challenge you to proclaim His excellence in everything you do. You know what will happen? Two things. You'll continue to believe it, but grow in your belief of it. That's one. And the second is, it'll become a habit for you. When you practice doing things a certain way, we get very conditioned. If you don't think that's true, what time do you wake up in the morning? Always the same. What's the first thing on your list to do? What is it you do, you know, at the house? We are conditioned. So condition yourselves on the things that matter most to proclaim the excellence of your Savior. Therefore, practicing your body part for the kingdom of God. And it will result in your understanding the priesthood in a far greater way 
and the holiness of God will surround you more. As James promises us in chapter 4, I believe it is, where he says, if you'll draw near to me, I will draw near to you. What a beautiful promise our Savior has given us in his scriptures. We're going to be away for two Sunday nights, and it's going to be tough. I truly love our Sunday night service. I love the fact that we're a little bit more laid back, and it's just us, and we'll read from the, the crowd a little bit. I'm going to miss it, but I'm going to join you from the place that God has put me with my family during those nights, and I'm going to proclaim his excellence. And I don't want to be alone in doing so. Because when we come back, I want to ensure that the body has been exercised during our time away.